it has been really difficult lately to get hired, especially starting out. The job market is, is garbage right now. I just gotta say, it's real garbage. Mm -hmm. We have a very special guest today, Lauren Brown. She's an art director at Wizards of the Coast, the host of the Painted in Color podcast, and an accomplished illustrator. That's correct. So you've been an yes. art director for a number of years. Um, most recently, you've been working at Wizards of the Coast. Um, yep. So I thought we would dive into the world of art directing and kind of that aspect of things, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Okay, first first question, act like I'm a, a dumb Dum dum, <laughs> what being an art director entails? So being an art director basically means that I get to tell people how to make things beautiful. And what an art director means depends on what studio I'm at. And I've been an art director at now four different studios. So each experience has been a little bit different. But for the most part, what I do is I manage teams, I hire artists, I determine what is best for the vision of whatever we're making. And I help direct, um, you know, with the overall vision with my other teammates and uh, the departments that are managing it, like game design, like production, like engineering, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's a big collaborative thing and it encapsulates many different hats that I have to wear. And sometimes I also get to do concept art and uh, vision art and things like that. But for the most part, it's been about five years since I started art directing and it's been a really enjoyable experience. And at Wizards of the Coast, I'm a digital art director. So that means that I work on the marketing side of things and I help art direct the trailers, um, the you know advertisements that go out. I commission artists to make marketing art. And uh, that's currently what I do right now. How did you find yourself in that, like that first art director position? Was it something that naturally occurred from being an illustrator? Like, did it tie into that or did it take like different skill sets to be considered for a position like that? So, so the funny thing was, is that I never actually expected to be an art director. I always thought that I was going to be a production artist, but I worked at an animation studio called Floyd County Productions here in Atlanta. And it was there where my art director took a chance on me for the first time and asked me if I wanted to direct my own department. And at first I actually told him no, because <laughs> I was just like, I don't want to be on the show anymore. But then another project came up and then I accepted the job and ended up falling into managing nine different people, which was a lot. Okay. I wouldn't recommend that. But it was essentially the fact that I had really good communication skills and I could collaborate really easily with a lot of my different teammates. And I was really good at giving advice and pointers and creating like better work processes. And I organically kind of fell into the position of art directing. And um, when I went into the game industry and in the video game industry, I actually had the ambition to be an art director officially because I realized that managing and directing was something that I really enjoyed. So once I became intentional about it, I started to actually build myself up for it and then became an art director when I was at Zynga, um, you know, a few years ago. So that's what, that's what my trajectory kind of looked like. It's different for everybody, but I think it's definitely easier if you set out to want to be an art director at first, because yeah, then yeah. you kind of know how to build your career. But the main things is that, you know, having good leadership skills, having good communication skills, understanding how the thing works that you're actually making. Um, all of those things are really essential for being a good art director, but management and directing takes a lot of energy and a lot of knowledge about how to really concisely communicate your vision and also work on how you can talk to different kinds of personalities because amongst artists especially there's a lot of different types of communication styles out there and mm -hmm. if you can't adapt to talking to everybody it's not going to be easy to get your vision across to your team kind of your natural leadership skills dropped you into that position or made you notice by your like uh your boss at the time i guess yeah. is what you're saying yeah and i also i mean I, I i i always say i fell into this thing but i'm not going to sugarcoat that I worked really hard as well. Like I really, I, you know, we would have hiatus when I was in animation, which means that we're essentially laid off for about two or three months. And mm -hmm. during that time, you're not getting paid, you're not getting any money, but they, they you know, they're like, yeah, you can come back. But I would always actually come into the studio and do personal projects. So I would always make sure that I was around and available. And when actual projects were going on, I would make sure that I was doing the work well, that my process was efficient. Like there was all these things that, 
I didn't realize that I was doing that showed that I was dedicated to the project and also wanted to be a leader. But don't recommend burning yourself out over it either. So be careful about that. I don't want to condone that kind of lifestyle. But it was a culmination of things that eventually got me noticed to be a leader. Has there ever been like in a directing position that's been um, like contract based and not full time? Because I know like most of the artists, you know, they're on three month contracts. But are you at these studios full time once you kind of upgrade to that position? Uh, I've been full time at a studio for 12 years now, so I don't know okay, what it's okay. like to be to be a contract artist, but I do know that oftentimes studios bring in contract art directors if they don't need a full-time art director. I actually tried to be a contract art director for another studio a long time ago, but they wanted somebody that was on full-time. And the reason why it's easier to be full-time at these studios is because they not only want you to help direct a vision, but it's easier to direct it when you have a dedicated team of artists that you know how to work with. and having that time to dedicate towards them is really important to be an effective art director. With that being said, you can be a contract art director. People do it for freelance. People do it for consulting, which is something that I've been interested in for a long time. So there's a lot of different ways that you can be an art director. But just in my personal experience, I've only ever been a studio art director. Gotcha. This leads me to another question that I've actually gotten from students of my own in the past. And it, it was always kind of a red flag in my head, but I didn't have the experience to really speak on it. And I know this isn't your experience because you're an extremely talented artist yourself. Stop but I've it. had students, <laughs> I've had students who like were struggling to draw, who were struggling to paint. And they were like, I still want to work in the art industry. And they're like, maybe I can pursue like an art directing position in the future. And to me, that seemed like an odd like mm. pathway but i also am not familiar with leadership roles in the art industry is that something that's possible because i i've had ad's that like they're not artists yeah it is possible but i will say that being an illustrator and being an artist is really for me at least fundamental for me being able to do my job well because I know what goes into what my artists have to make and I know how much effort things take um, but at the same time I haven't had all of the skills that I was art directing for example uh, I can do 3d modeling but I'm not a great 3d modeler and that's not my field of expertise but I can art direct 3d modelers because I know what good looks like I know what good textures look like I know how that end result needs to go mm -hmm. but you know, especially at Wizards, I know that a lot of the commissioning art directors are not artists themselves, and some of them are. But what I will say is that they likely have already demonstrated really strong leadership skills or a really strong artistic eye. Um, and it's not easy to, you can't really come out the gate being an art director. That is a role that you have to build up to because mm -hmm. it is communication, it is leadership, and you have to, you do have to prove that you can do those things that are asked of you. And so, when artists are not good at the thing that they want to grow their skills in, but they say, I want to be an art director one day, I usually have the knee-jerk reaction of like, maybe build your foundational skills first and maybe understand how to communicate to art, what the foundations are, what the language is behind speaking about art and understanding why things look good. What is silhouette? What is composition? What is good lighting? What is, you know, value and texture? learn at least the language and i feel like as you're learning the language you also organically get better at being an artist but it's that communication that's really key and it also depends on what kind of art director you're going to be for games generally i've only seen artists who have become art directors um same for especially for animation animation is actually huge because art directors really get down there and do a lot of the work for commissioning Again, you don't necessarily have to be an artist, but you need to know how to speak to art. You need to have an appreciation and an understanding for art. And I can't honestly say that I would know how to get into that kind of position without already having been an artist. But mm -hmm. if there's a way that you can demonstrate those skills, then that gives you a better position to apply to that job with. But I wouldn't say apply to it without any experience yet, because that's not really, it's not an inexperienced position to be in. That makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, as a freelance artist myself, like I've worked with a lot of ADs and 
The ones that like actually can do paint overs can communicate what they want because they're also artists have always been a much better experience. But it's also like a lot more pressure because I'm like, oh, if this art director can paint better than me, they're going to judge the shit out of me. <laughs> and I'm like sweating and I'm like, oh, I got to I got to make mom and dad proud is like is always what it feels like. <laughs> so like the front end's always smoother. But like when it comes to turning the piece in, like I'm never confident about it because I'm like, oh, they're so good. <laughs> oh. That, that's really funny because when I commission artists now, I'm like, this artist is amazing and I'm honored to be able to commission them. But also understanding how to critique an artist that's better than you is a really interesting skill to have because I'm like, oh, I would admire this art, but now I have to look at it deeper and see, okay, this is actually how it's not serving this project and you have to change these colors because we're not accurately representing the character or this is not good for the brand, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different kinds of eyes that you need to apply to art, even when you're commissioning someone better. But I actually try to avoid giving paint over as much as possible because I want the artist to play and fly and express themselves because the way that I would do things is not necessarily the way that everybody else would do anything. And it's not necessarily the only correct answer for the project. And that was a huge learning that I had to take as an art director is that my exact vision is not necessarily the only way that something can look amazing. And I think a good art director has to have that kind of that kind of skill and that kind of vision, um, because when you pick an artist, if you if you're good at what you do, you pick an artist for what they're particularly good at. And this is something that a lot of students struggle with, because many people try to apply for different positions by being exactly what that studio already employs. And oftentimes I really appreciate when people have their own specific point of view or when they have their own voice and I'll hire them because of that voice. So even though it might be intimidating to work for an art director that is experienced as an artist, there is a reason why they've chosen you. And it means that we're impressed with what you do. So don't be afraid of us. We're just people <laughs> and we're often very much super nerds and dorks and that that llama fell over so that illustrates <laughs> my point perfectly um you know we're we we can be awkward too and we can we're we can be down to earth people depending on who you work with i think i've had like two i i can put my art directing experience not my art directing but my experience with art directors in two different categories or like being hired by them one where like they're like oh i like your style i want you to do you and then other ones like we need you to stay in model. We need you to like, you know, do the project exactly like this. Like the line work has to look like this, like almost like a cog in the machine type of thing. Mm. Um, and I, I felt like with me, um, haven't, I've had art directors where I can feel that they're frustrated that I'm taking maybe too long to figure out how to stay on model for a certain project. Have yeah. you had that experience where like, Maybe you love the artist's work. Maybe you even like what's being turned in, but it's just not right for the project. How do you handle that interaction with an artist? And like, at what point does that become not worth the trouble for the project's sake, even if you like what's being turned in? Yeah, that part is really difficult because I I haven't had to fire fire an artist, but there have been times where we couldn't, we simply couldn't go with a piece of commissioned work and because, because it wasn't right for the vision. Sometimes it's tough because sometimes people have their skill set, And if you try to fit somebody into the box that they don't necessarily belong in, it can be really difficult to make them get there. So generally I try not to commission anybody who already doesn't fit with what I'm trying to go for. But sometimes it happens where an artist will either veer off to, to give me what they think I want and then I have to really be prescriptive in my communication and be more, you know, like, okay, like be just like, I have to send references essentially to be like, Hey, so this is what I'm wanting from you. You're kind of going over here. Let's bring you back here and find out how we can land to the same spot. And on the artist end, if an art director seems like they're getting frustrated with you, then kind of back up, take a breath. It's okay. It, it gets, I know it gets really stressful to not like to feel like you're not hitting the vision because I've been in that position before too. And it's really tough because I'm like, Oh, like, am I just not good enough? Usually it's not that you're not good enough. It just means that 
either they're not communicating their vision well or that there might have been something that you misread that's something got, that got lost in translation and there's been a lot of times where you've been sent a brief i'm sure and mm -hmm. forgot to read a line in the brief and then you're like oh no i've completely missed the mark because i forgot to read thoroughly so read the brief read it again now <laughs> read it a third time and then start the project because otherwise um you might end up running into a lot of heartache and I have been there, I have seen artists miss the brief, I've missed the brief myself. So just be careful about reading your brief. The more communication from an artist, the better. So ask questions, keep calm, read things three times. That's what I would say when it's hard to get it right. I have a, <laughs> I have a fun example about this. I, uh, I got an art test a number of years ago. It was two pages, the brief for it, Oh the, the first page and a half was like very generalized. It was mm -hmm. like, we we want so many of this. We want, it was for a concept art position. So there was like multiple images that had to relate essentially. But they were spelled out very general. And it was like, oh, okay. So as long as like they're on theme and they all like kind of match in the same world is like what I got. And then at the bottom, there was like one sentence and it read kind of like an example the first time I read it. Okay. So I did like this very generalized, like, um, like, oh, I did like a couple buildings and then some props to go along with them. And I thought it was like this very generalized, like, um, period piece, essentially, because that's how the, you know, the first um, page and a half read. Yeah. Turns out what I thought was the example was actually the, 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 the important part. And uh -oh. needless to say, I did not get hired for that position, even though I thought at the time that I had killed the art, like I was like, yes, I did a great job. Um, no. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, definitely read, oh, no. read that a couple times. Oh no, Dustin. I, have, you, have you ever had like any other different like examples of like, have you ever had a horror story working with an art director where you really couldn't get the bridge, like the gap, the bridge beside that? art test so there's there's a recent project i'm working on that i can't mention uh. however there's like um there was a piece i did for them about a year ago and it felt like i was being used as the guinea pig for like how to develop this like magic effect yeah like i was brought onto the project being like oh all the concept like passes have been done we know what we want for these different elements yeah um and i was like oh great 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 so I finished most of the piece, and then they're like, oh, we want these magic effects, like, here and here on the piece. And I was like, oh, okay, um, can you send me, like, you know, what it looks like? And they're like, oh, we haven't developed it yet. Can you, like, and they kind of described it, and I was like, sure, sure, sure. Um, I went through, like, eight revisions, and it turns out, like, apparently, I wasn't just the illustrator, but they had, like, tricked me into being, or this is what it felt like. I don't know, maybe my perception of it's wrong, but... It, it felt like I was tricked into being, like, the concept artist for their magic effects going forward. Oh. It took, like, six months of revisions. And I felt like I was doing a horrible job because it kept getting, like, denied and changed. Oh, that's awful. And, like, I was super frustrated by it because the finished art had pretty much been done by then other than this one element of it. And I was really stressed by the end of it. And then I finally, like, talked to my art director, like, on a call... And they were like, oh, you're doing a great job. You're so patient with us. You're helping out a ton. And I was like, why didn't you say that like three months ago? Yes. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God. I was like stressing for months. Yeah. Designing in the dark is the worst feeling. Oh. When you don't know how you're doing is the worst. I I'm pretty like, much do I suck? force that client to call me every time before we start <laughs> like an, another piece. And I'm like, just, just uh, yeah. can you just spell this out for me? Like I'm a five-year-old, please. Yes. And, and it's been very oh, beneficial <laughs> for sure. And a lot of times I need that too, because I don't like to be in a void whenever I'm doing some kind of design or working or anything. If a client is going to be particular, I want them to tell me everything up front and be like, okay, tell me what you want from me. So I don't have to guess and I don't have to worry and just lay it all out for me. So I try to do that for certain artists if they want, um, but you had mentioned art test earlier, and I think that's a really good thing to touch on too, because art directing an art test is a little bit different from art directing an artist that I'm working directly with full time. 
Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, it is. Art tests are... <laughs> that's actually... Art tests are a really good example of... Please read the brief. Please read the brief. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> because my goodness. I've, I've been a hiring manager um, as an art director before. And I've had so many art tests come back where either the artist just straight up didn't read the brief and just did what they wanted to do, or they, they read the brief and said, okay, so what I'm going to do is not just this brief, but all this other stuff that wasn't asked for. And listen, every, like everybody who's listening, I know that y'all want to flex. I know that you're a really cool artist and you want to show your best foot forward. That's really sweet and great. And I love it. However, if it's not what I asked you to do, please don't do it because it's not a part of the judging criteria. If I say, draw a character in three different outfits, draw a character in three different outfits. If I want it in color, then color it. If I don't, then you can either color it or not. It's fine. But what I don't want is for you to draw the character with three different outfits and then draw a bunch of props that go with the character or draw an environment that goes with the character or draw a bunch of offshoot characters that weren't asked as a part of the because I've had artists do that before and what it does is not only does it take the time that you should be spending doing the main art test but it also creates a lot of muddiness around the judging criteria I'm meant to judge you on the three characters that you can create but I didn't ask for all this other stuff when you're doing an art test the thing that I would recommend is flex on the thing that you know you're good at within the parameters that the art test has given you. For example, when I first got into animation, I had to do a environment test. I was a background artist for five years and I, I was, the brief was basically take this room and act like a bomb went off inside this room. And I was like, okay, cool. I can do that. And so, um, you have to explode the room. It was actually a really fun art test. And I was like, okay, like, how do I distinguish myself from making from making this like very much here's what my skill set is within the test what I did was I really highlighted the drapery and the beautiful like organic shapes of the curtain that had been burned and ripped and you know I one of was like slumped on the floor and there was another organic element over there that was like I put particular detail into that because I'm really good at organic drawing I'm good at swirly shapes and plants and fabrics and that's what I wanted to highlight so that art test had gotten me hired because I stayed within the parameters of the art test, but I showed off the skills that I was really good at. I wanted, I wanted them to see. Mm. So think about what you're, what, what you love in a piece of art when you have to be more prescriptive, when you can't do your style, when you're in animation or games, when you have a particular thing to work within, you can flex a little bit on the things that if you're good at, you know, character poses, or if you're good at environment lighting, flex on those things, as long as it's within the test that you're taking. So that's the advice I would give about our tests. I definitely see it with like students. Um, I mean, I guess that's my experience. Um, not, you know, I haven't art directed anybody, but I, I've, I've noticed that students specifically will tie their, their works to their ego a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get past that a lot of times. Like they, they want to show their, you know, their specific skill sets, even if it's unrelated to like a project or an assignment. And um, when they get criticisms on that, you know, not always does it go well. So I think realizing that, like, you're being hired for a very specific skill set or a very specific job. And yeah. then, you know, the better you can do that job or the, you know, the more professional you can be on that one thing is super important. Yeah, no, being an artist is a very individual type of thing. But when you work in a team you have to understand how to, I guess, play along with what is, what is being asked of you because you are, you're here ultimately to do a job, but at the same time, like there's, there's always place to have fun within that, but overall you've been hired because you're a good artist and they think that you can fit within the parameters that have been given to you. And mm -hmm. so it's better to, I hate to say conform, but ultimately in animation that's what you kind of have to do but within that conformity there are little elements that you can add that help yourself stand out which is why in certain animations they have people who 
are particularly good at animating like vis effects or character animation or dances and they'll have that person take that scene to highlight those skill sets and that's where they can really start to show off so give them glimpses of that but don't keep breaking the things that i've asked you to do because it just it just slows everything down it takes so much more time to do that um you know like when you're working a studio job it isn't your personal work so you can't treat it like it's your personal work if you want to do your personal work do your personal work on the side over the, that's fine you can do that i actually have been doing that ever since i started my career i've never stopped mm -hmm. doing personal work which is why i still do conventions because i had to stay within a certain style and i'm like okay this is fun over here but it's not personally fulfilling to me which is okay i don't want to lose my skills as my own person and so i kept illustrating not everybody has the energy to do that, but it's like, it's one of the necessities that you have to do. Some artists are also not meant to be studio artists. You have to be real with yourself. If it's taking pieces of your soul away to do certain types of work, then maybe it's just not for you. And that's okay. That is totally fine. I know so many people who have done that and actually really admire them for having the awareness to know that they're going to just fade away <laughs> like if they have to stay oh, yeah. into a certain place mm -hmm. um and and for me what i've had to do is really separate my own identity and that's what helped me you know el like stay able to work in studios and conform to a certain style it's not for everybody and it's hard work but make your art director's life a little bit easier will you <laughs> it's always appreciated <laughs> I mean, that's a big part of it, of it is being like an ideal client in a way to get to get rehired. I think there's definitely been jobs where like, you know, I've been hired and like maybe the end result was good, but I might not have been the most uh, pleasant to work with or like clicked super quickly. And I'm like, I'm probably not going to get called back for that job. <laughs> As somebody who like loves just like doing independent work, like I'm like, eh, I've got that client on my resume now. It's fine. I don't need to be, you know, called back. But, yeah. You know, for a lot of people, like, that's the goal is to, like, you know, have a steady, you know, workflow with some of these, you know, art directors or companies. That leads me into another thing is I think there's an educational gap right now. Hmm. Correct me if you if I'm wrong, because obviously my perspective comes from a different place. But I see a lot of students being taught, like, oh, they need to generalize, they need to do this, they need to do that if they want to get hired, they need to be good at like every aspect of something. And I think that um, that advice is probably 40 years late. I think it, it seems much more like most industry positions are very specialized. Yeah. Does that make, does that sound accurate or am I being like too specific? I think that it might be a little prescriptive to say okay. that you must be a specialist because everybody has their own skill sets and every studio every studio's requirement is different for example if you're working in games indie studios can usually hire somebody who's more of a generalist because it's a smaller team so the more hats you can wear the better if you're in a big studio like you know EA or Blizzard or Riot it's likely that they want you to be a specialist because they have so many people that they don't need you all up in somebody else's department. They don't need you to do concept art and 3D modeling. Mm -hmm. They will hire you for concept art and sometimes specifically for character or props or creatures. And it just depends on where you're going and what your aim is. If you know that you're a specialist, maybe a big studio is better for you. No, I mean, that, that perspective is great to hear. Um, I kind of want to ask some more spicy questions, if anything's like too too much just we can cut it or just be like move on or whatever you're all good is that okay yeah okay so i know there's a lot of concern specifically in the industry about ai and i know that wizard <laughs> specifically had an incident i know their official stance on it but i was wondering if you've noticed any influx in your day-to-day -day, like life with those issues and how a studio might handle that situation. So before I answer this question, I just want to make clear that I am not speaking as a spokesperson of Wizards. I, this is not on behalf of Wizards at all. This is just my personal opinion and how I've seen my own job be affected by AI. So just wanted to say that up front. Of course. AI has been making my job really hard. <laughs> 
it's it's really frustrating because oftentimes the way I look for artists is through different platforms like Pinterest or social media or the people who I know. And when I'm searching for artists, the last thing that I want to see is AI. I want a human artist who can make a human product, who can actually follow directions and apply what I'm asking for to, you know, and, and through their own personal lens. I do not want to ever hire anybody who does AI ever like flat, no matter where I end up, no matter what job I'm working on. I want to hire an actual real lived human artist with real lived human experience. AI is a scourge. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, I, mean, I agree. <laughs> yeah, like I have so many I have so many feelings about AI. Um it really is and this is part of the reason why it's so hard to have work and get a job and you know, do freelance or independent or etc. It's making it harder because there's nothing out has, that has been like this before there has never mm -hmm. been a software that can generate an essentially a complete image there's just never been that before so people compare it to photography people compare it to like oh like it's just new technology it's like a tool like any other tool and it's it's not like photoshop mm -hmm. is a tool painting like watercolor is a tool photoshop is only a means to create art through you still have to know how to make art. You still have to understand lighting and color and texture, et cetera, et cetera, in order to make good art. You don't have to understand anything in order to make good art with AI, which is not even art, by the way, because it is just a, congl a conglomeration of everybody's work from the internet that's been scraped and co-opted into this machine. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's been making, it's been making my job harder because I, it's just, it's just cluttering up all the avenues that I use to look for artists. And so it's really frustrating to have to wade through the pool before I find a human to actually commission <laughs> again. So so I'm not a fan of AI. <laughs> so do you think that's hindering companies hiring new artists and they're just kind of going back to their old rosters? I don't think it's hindering hiring new artists because if you're determined enough and you actually want to find a new point of view, you will find it. But mm -hmm. what I will say is that there are companies out there who are taking advantage of the fact that AI is a thing that can just generate images. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I'm not going to name any particular companies. A lot of, a lot of them are actually smaller, but it's to save money. And so those smaller jobs that would have been somebody's entry level position are now getting taken by AI. And they're like, Oh, well, I could just do it myself. So, but you don't, but like what they're, what they're missing is that having a human artist working, means that you can try so many different kinds of ideas and different points of views and different, you have somebody's lived experience who's going into helping your product be better. And without that, AI is just going to generate the thing that has all the biases from the internet. And mm -hmm. you're not going to get the best thing that way. And so larger companies, fortunately for now, I still see that, you know, they are hiring human artists. They still want human artists, but I fear for the point where companies no longer see the value. Um, I don't think this thing will happen with Wizards because Wizards brand is like all about human artists. So I don't see that happening ever. And Wizards already yeah, made yeah. a stance about it that is public. I don't have to say anything to that. But for other companies, I just hope they see the value in human artists and why that point of view is really valuable. The my the most rewarding part about commissioning artists is the fact that they get to apply their own fresh take on something that I want them to do. And their style is a unique conglomeration of all of their 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 whole life, their point of view, how they see things, what they find beautiful in the world, and I would never want to replace that with anything else. Like that like why would you ever bypass that? That's something that so many people don't understand. So you're not going to get the same product. You like you can't make anything new with it. Inherently, you can't. I think as like, because I do mostly concept work, um, we haven't noticed too much of an impact. At least, you know, at the at the companies I work for. Luckily, that's good. Um, but it's also a point in the pipeline where I think it's a little harder. Concept work's all about making new things. Definitely seeing like. 
I don't know. I, I guess I, I don't want to call out any companies, like you said. I'll, I'll move on. We'll move on. We'll move on. No, I don't want to get Anywho. in trouble, so don't call any more. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But the, la- the last thing I will say to that is, like, I have a very strong view, like, a, an opinion about AI. If, if certain people want to use it to augment their process, like, I don't, I wouldn't condone it. I don't use it in my process. Um, I know probably some art directors will because it's, like, it helps create mood boards and et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. People will do that, whatever, but I I would not want to use AI for as long as it is not ethical. We need better regulations around it. We need we need artists need more support around it. This I mean this goes for artists, writers, musicians, every creative field um, that can get replaced by AI. We just need we need better regulations um, and boundaries around it because if if it's allowed to run mm-hmm. rampant, then it's not going to spell a good future for anybody. So. People yeah. are fighting out there. People are, you know, speaking out about this. So, yeah. Uh, but keep up the good fight. Don't lose all the hope. Um, please keep creating and be be even more human for the fact that there is AI now. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the encouragement that I'll give is, like, just express yourself through your work. I Yeah, I definitely... I've seen, like, very talented artists give it a try. And I almost... I almost worry that that puts their whole, like, body of work into question in some ways. Like... If I know how to paint, mm. like, I don't want to go anywhere near it just based on, like, what people might think. You know what I mean? Yeah. At least right now with the, you know, the way it's being used and how it's, you know, just copy pasting the Internet. Yeah. Maybe in the future when the technology is a bit more ethical. I don't know. I don't know what the future holds, but like uh, a 10 foot pole. We're in a we're in an unprecedented time. That's for sure. It's it's this is nothing that we have any experience with because this is all happening in real time and so you know i'm not going to i don't want to make people feel like they're bad people for using it to help augment their process but it's just personally something that i wouldn't touch right now um because every usage of it makes it better and i don't want to make it better um so (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah. it's yeah it's it's a very complex topic to be sure and yeah, that's all. It's, a, it's a, that probably is a whole another episode, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one more spicy question if you're up for it. I like the spice. This is fun. Um, have you ever had to fire somebody? Have or like let go? Because I know a lot of freelancers. You're like, mm, you don't technically fire them. You just don't call them back. Um, has there ever been any like? You know, you don't gotta give names, but I want the drama. Give me the, the <laughs> art director the drama. I want you would, the tea. You would like the tea. If you can say. If not, we'll just, we'll just cut it. We'll just cut it here. It's fine. I can speak to... I, I'm not, I'm not going to mention any particular companies or any particular yeah. names. Please don't. But the artists that I have hired and commissioned, I haven't fired... I haven't really fired anybody from that. Um, you know, sometimes you commission a backup if you like need to use one instead if you have the budget for it. What I will say is that there have been two artists in my career that I've worked with that could no longer be a contributor to the team. I'll say it, I'll say it as di- diplomatically as possible. Okay, okay. The first one just simply didn't want to do the full job description. Like that like you have to do okay. your job. So <laughs> whoops. And Oopsies. a lot of that was yeah, a lot of that was pride, a lot of that was desire to do their own personal work and not really do the job anymore. Uh, a lot yeah. of that was unwillingness to learn the software and systems that we had to use because this is in game development um mm-hmm. and they just didn't want to to have to be bothered to do the things that me and the other artists were doing and it wasn't my responsibility to fire anybody so i didn't have to fire this person fortunately um but they ended up leaving um on their own volition i think otherwise they probably would have been put in other reprimands and things like that but um in that particular case that artist was more meant to do their own personal work. And they ended up doing that and they had a, they they're doing really well at it. I've been following them and I'm like, "Oh, I love their work. This is great. This is what they they see, they seem like they should be doing and they're happier doing it." So that's what I mean about some artists are not suited for that studio environment um, because eventually they just can't they can't do that project anymore. Um, which I don't blame I don't blame them for for feeling that way, but you do have to do your job if you work there. Uh, yeah, the yeah. other yeah, the other artist was going through a lot of like you know personal stuff which happens a lot but they couldn't reconcile 
the they couldn't reconcile their issues in order to do the work and also they were so hung up on those issues that they were doing the work very very slowly and poorly and so we just weren't getting anything that we we needed from them and when mm -hmm. i run into this as an art director what i really try to make sure is that i am meeting with this person frequently and not just asking like how can you do the job better because that's not that's not how you solve anything it's more how can i help you do your job in the best way that you can do it let me know how i can like what resources can i give you is there anything that can free up any like any blockers anything that's preventing you from doing your job effectively and that's what any good manager should do but sometimes uh even that is not enough and other solutions have to be taken on board and so i've never had to formally fire anybody usually we find alternatives before that happens mm -hmm. but I, I try really really hard to to work with people and meet them where they're at um and if they can't meet me back then i can't really do much about it well you sound lovely to work for <laughs> That's all I'm I try. I try. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really. I mean, this has been years, years of mm -hmm. training and communicating with other people and understanding different personality types. I am a black woman in art direction. And so this has also been a lot of trial and error of garnering the respect that mm -hmm. I essentially, you know, like, I, I, everybody deserves respect. We deserve respect. But if I'm your manager and I'm giving you, you know, the tools to basically do the project successfully, I want you to be successful. And so through all those experiences, I've had to be a more empathetic person. I've had to be someone who's really good at communication. I've had to be somebody who's okay with confrontation, but in a constructive way. So over the years, I, I've, I've become proud of my management style because it does work to bring people together and to, make people their best their best artists and their best version of themselves so that's what i set out to do in my work and that's what i want to see out of other managers as well i guess the last thing that i want to leave people with is like it's just i know this is a really difficult industry to get into and i i feel like i've somehow stumbled upon this role but with this role, I really want to talk to people and I really want to give them the tools to succeed. And I'm like, I don't know how I got here, but I want to like, <laughs> like by hell or high water, I want to get people in with me to do, to do this and to have a successful career and to be happy in their work. So when somebody gives you an offering for help, don't refuse to take it. Ask many questions. It's okay to ask questions. Ask for feedback from your fellow friends. Ask for help. It's okay. Um, we don't have to do this this job in a vacuum. We don't have to be completely isolated. We can create a community where we talk to each other and uplift each other and support each other. Artists got to stick out for each other. We got to look out for each other. So rely and lean on your community in these trying times um, and do your best at what you do. Like seriously, just work hard, but also get some rest because it's, it's stressful right now, y'all. It's real stressful. Thank you so much. Um, you can find Lauren Brown at her podcast, Painted in Color. I'll put the link down below. And where else can they find you at? Uh, you can find me anywhere on social media under Lab Illustration, um, you know, uh, Instagram, Blue Sky, uh, Twitter. We're not calling it the other name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, Facebook. So uh, Painted in Color is an art podcast dedicated to uplifting uh, marginalized artists and also supporting mental health and artists and positive working methods. If you want to listen to it, it's also on YouTube. I do it with co-hosts Mia Araujo and Eric Wilkerson, and we've been doing it for three years now. So... We've been doing this for a while now, and please give it a watch if you ever need advice, if you ever need to not feel like you're so alone in this um, very difficult but rewarding field. If you also want to find me and see me in person, I will be at Lightbox Expo at Table 330 in the Artist Alley, so I'm really looking forward to that. It's an amazing convention, and for anybody who's starting out, I would definitely recommend going to this con because there are some fantastic experienced people who you can get advice from who you can network with you can make friends with and get really close to and be it's just wonderful it's like a big art party so head on by the light box if you're going to be there i will see you there yeah and i will say that last year i got more job offers through Lightbox than i did all year combined really 
So Lightbox is the is the place to be if you want, you know, to get hired, I guess. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> so I, I definitely recommend it. It's it's a fantastic venue. And I also found um, we also found our editor through through Lightbox and I found a few mentees through there as well. So um, I am open for mentorship opportunities, too, which has been something that I've started to take on Ooh. this year. And I really enjoy That's that cool. work. So, yeah. <laughs> Are you having your, it's your personal table at Lightbox? Yes, it's my personal awesome. table. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's, it's just going to be selling my art, but if people wanted to come by and ask about mentorship stuff, and, they, you know, they see this episode, then I can, I can slot them in and see when is best to do something like that. And I do mentorships about portfolio building, job interviewing. Um, if people want to be art directors or managers, I do mentoring for that as well, management skills and tactics. Uh, I do just general art building, um, all of it basically. So yeah, I'm available for that right now. Okay, so I'll be stopping by your table. Cool. Yes. <laughs> Definitely take advantage of that. I feel like I rambled a lot and I hope that was okay. <laughs> oh no, it was it was perfect. And I, and I highly recommend Lauren's podcast. Thank you, Dustin. I appreciate that. Uh, do you want to compare Pokemon real quick? Yes. <laughs> look at this guy. Look at how beautiful he is. Look, look at Ugh. this Raichu. I have... I think I got this one from Japan. Oh, that's where I got this one. Really? Yeah, the Pokemon Center has some dope plushies, but look at its cute little face. And look at this, look at this sweet what? little thing. <laughs> oh. It's a ditto. I love him. <laughs>